Thank you for standing by. This is the conference operator. Welcome to the ExtendiCare second quarter 2020 results conference call. As a reminder, all participants are in listen-only mode and the conference is being recorded. After the presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. To join the question queue, you may press star then 1 on your telephone keypad. Should you need assistance during the conference call, you may signal an operator by pressing star and 0. I would now like to turn the conference over to Jillian Fountain for opening remarks. Please go ahead. Thank you, and good morning, everyone. Welcome to ExtendiCare's second quarter 2020 results conference call. With me today is ExtendiCare's president and CEO, Michael Guerra, and senior vice president and CFO, David Bacon. Our second quarter 2020 results were disseminated yesterday and are available on our website. The audio webcast of today's call is also available on our website, along with an accompanying slide presentation which viewers may advance themselves. A replay of the call will be available later this afternoon until August 28th. The replay numbers and passcodes have been provided in our press release, and an archived recording of this call will also be available on our website. Before we get started, please be reminded that today's call may include forward-looking statements regarding our future operations. Such statements involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that may cause actual results to differ materially from those expressed or implied today. We have identified such factors in our public filings with the securities regulators and suggest that you refer to those filings. As we discuss our performance, please bear in mind that all figures are in Canadian dollars unless otherwise noted. With that, I'll turn the call over to Michael. Thank you, Jillian, and good morning, everyone. Before we get to our second quarter results, I'll take a moment to review our progress on managing through the COVID-19 pandemic and to thank our hardworking and committed team members. We remain vigilant in our ongoing battle to keep the novel coronavirus out of our homes and communities. Our focus remains firmly on doing everything possible to protect the health and well-being of our residents, clients, and staff. We have increased resources to manage our operations in today's environment to prevent the spread of COVID-19. We're also preparing for a possible second wave by enhancing infection prevention measures to address the unique nature of this virus, including maintaining sufficient inventory of PPE, universal masking for all staff and visitors, single-site employer policies, limiting long-term care room occupancy to a maximum of two residents per room in Ontario, and regular voluntary testing of staff in our Ontario long-term care homes. We continue to refine our protocols and processes as we learn more about the virus. One of our strongest lines of defense against preventing outbreaks is regular staff testing. Since we launched this voluntary program in June, we've conducted over 33,000 tests and identified positive cases in 20 long-term care homes. We were able to quickly isolate these team members and prevent further transmission of the virus to residents and other staff. We're actively advocating for the expansion of this program to other provinces in which we operate. Our staff continue to demonstrate exceptional commitment in caring for our residents and clients with true compassion and kindness. Their ready adaptability to evolving processes and protocols is a testament to their genuine commitment to doing everything possible to protect those in our care. I'm deeply grateful for the important work they do and thank them for their ongoing hard work and devotion to our mission. As of today, of our 69 long-term care homes and retirement communities, one long-term care home is currently in outbreak. And thanks to our testing program, the outbreak is limited to just one positive case of COVID-19 in an asymptomatic staff member. In respect of our extended care assist clients, none are currently in outbreak. With that, let's turn to our second quarter results starting on slide four. Our second quarter is down from the same period last year as the COVID-19 pandemic drove lower volumes in our home health care segment and increased operating costs, particularly in our long-term care operations. 
This was partially offset by government funding for pandemic-related expenses and growth in retirement and other operations. We expect COVID-19 to continue to affect our operations in future quarters as we remain focused on protecting the health and safety of our residents, clients, and staff. While the occupancy-based funding of our long-term care operations is largely protected for the balance of 2020, we continue to incur additional costs associated with our enhanced infection prevention measures. To date, we have incurred an estimated $11 million in pandemic expenses in excess of government funding. We understand that the fight against COVID-19 is far from over. However, we are happy to see some initial signs of recovery as restrictions are lifted. Home health volumes, while still well below previous levels, have shown steady improvement over the past two months. Our Ontario retirement communities have resumed in-person tours and admissions, and long-term care admissions have resumed, although not beyond two residents per room. Despite the impacts of COVID-19, our financial position remains strong with $122 million of cash on hand and no scheduled debt maturities until Q1 2022. Moving to slide five in our long-term care operations, the impact of COVID-19 became more evident in Q2 as occupancy levels declined and costs to protect residents and staff exceeded COVID funding programs announced to date. Occupancy levels at our long-term care homes declined to 93.5%, down from the usual run rate above 97%. Despite the reduction in occupancy, our funding is protected as Ontario has preserved 100% of its occupancy-based funding to the end of the year. In addition, Alberta has introduced additional funding for COVID-19, which includes an allocation to address occupancy reductions, and we expect Saskatchewan and Manitoba to provide some level of support to assist with COVID-19 impacts in the future. We have highlighted the critical need to replace aging long-term care homes and the pressing demand for additional long-term care beds for many years. Accordingly, we were pleased when the Ontario government recently announced changes to its construction funding program for long-term care. The program will redevelop 12,000 beds and add 8,000 beds over the next five years. While this will not be sufficient to replace all of the Class B and C beds in Ontario, it is a welcome step in the right direction. We have submitted applications to build 4,200 beds, which would replace all of our existing C beds and add 931 new long-term care beds to our portfolio. We continue to work closely with the government to get the necessary approvals to expedite our projects that are feasible under the new program. Turning to slide six, our paramed operations have also been impacted by COVID-19, with comparable average daily volumes down by 20.7% this quarter from Q2 last year. In addition, higher back office costs and COVID expenses further contributed to a decline in NOI for our home health care operations. The significant declines in demand were caused by deferral of elective procedures in hospitals, provincial restrictions on non-urgent home care services, and the choices made by some patients to self-isolate and suspend the services they were receiving. As COVID-19 restrictions have eased, we have seen steady improvement in pyramids volumes. Average daily volumes for the four weeks ending August 9th are up 10% from the Q2 average. While we can't predict how long the impacts of the virus will last, we do expect average daily volumes to continue to improve as the pandemic recedes. The final phase of the implementation of our new information system was put on hold to focus on our COVID-19 response, leaving Alberta, which represents approximately 5% of our business volume, still to be converted onto the new cloud-based platform. 
We are targeting to complete the conversion in Q4 2020. Once the pandemic has eased, we will refocus on achieving the back office efficiencies the system is designed to support. Paramed employs over 9,000 staff members, essential frontline caregivers who provide health services to clients, supported by back office staff that coordinate operations in the field. Given the transient nature of the softness in market demand, we applied for the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy for the financial flexibility it provides to maintain our workforce through the pandemic. Keeping our team in place ensures that we can respond quickly to increases in demand for home health care services and return to normal volumes as the pandemic recedes. We will continue to assess Paramount eligibility for further wage subsidy support as the year unfolds. Turning to slide seven and our retirement living operations, COVID-19 restrictions on in-person tours and enhanced infection control protocols to protect residents and staff led to lower occupancy and increased costs this quarter. However, continued occupancy improvements in our lease-up communities year over year contributed to improvements in revenue and net operating income. At June 30th, Stabilized occupancy was 91.3%, down 150 basis points from March 31st. As restrictions have eased, we have resumed in-person tours in our Ontario communities and are awaiting a decision to be able to do the same in Saskatchewan, where we continue to conduct virtual tours. We are seeing early signs of recovery in our occupancy levels, with stabilized occupancy up 50 basis points at July 31st to 91.8%. On slide eight, our assist contract services and SGP group purchasing services continue to show strong growth, exceeding 10% CAGR in revenue and NOI over the past eight quarters. At the end of Q2, SGP, together with our partners, provided cost-effective products and services to approximately 75,200 senior residents across Canada, up 28.1% from the same quarter last year and up 3.1% from the first quarter of 2020. Since the end of Q2, the network has continued to grow as we've added a number of new clients, including Golden Life and Group Lokia bringing our service coverage to approximately 79,000 senior residents across Canada. We continue to develop opportunities to expand SGP and assist through additional services and product offerings and by expanding the reach of our sales team into other geographers. I will now turn to David Bacon, our Chief Financial Officer, to provide insight into our financial results from the second quarter. Thanks, Michael. I'll first provide an overview of our corporate financial performance for the second quarter, and then I'll provide some financial highlights of the individual business segments. For ease of comparison, when discussing our revenue and NOI, I will be excluding the impact of our BC home health care operations, which we exited as previously announced in January of this year, and the incremental funding in our home health care operations from Bill 148 we received in Q2 of 2019 both impacts of which are outlined on slide 20 of the investor presentation. Turning now to slide 10 and our results for the quarter, which were negatively impacted by COVID costs in excess of funding, a 20.7% decline in business volumes and higher back office and administrative costs in our home health care operations, partially offset by growth in the retirement and other operation segments. While we reported growth in consolidated revenue this quarter of 4.7% or $12.7 million to $281.9 million, this included $27.2 million of COVID-related funding to offset, in part, the $36.7 million of COVID-related operating expenses we incurred in the quarter. The impact of the net COVID costs, coupled with the impact of COVID on our home health care volumes, resulted in a decline in our consolidated NOI of $13.5 million, or 40.3% to 
to 19.9 million compared to prior year, with NOI margins declining to 7.1% from 12.4%. Likewise, adjusted EBITDA declined by 17 million to 8.2 million due to the decline in NOI and increased administrative costs, in part due to COVID. AFFO decreased by 12 million to 2.9 million compared to the same prior year period, driven by the decline in adjusted EBITDA offset by lower income taxes. The estimated after-tax impact on AFFO of the net COVID costs is 7.8 million or 8.7 cents per share. To further elaborate on the impacts of COVID on our NOI and adjusted EBITDA, we have incurred an estimated 20 million of pandemic-related operating expenses and 1.2 million in COVID-related administrative costs to date. These costs include investments in additional staffing, procurement of PPE, increased infection control, and cleaning supplies. These costs are partially offset by 10.2 million in revenue or expense recovery associated with the various provincial government programs the net resulting in a reduction of our adjusted EBITDA of approximately $11 million. In addition to these amounts, we have also incurred a further $17.4 million in pandemic pay, fully funded by programs announced by the Ontario and Alberta governments to temporarily increase hourly wages for certain eligible frontline employees. Not including in these expenses I just noted, we have also purchased an additional $12.7 million in PPE inventory to date, to ensure that we continue to have sufficient supply, particularly as restrictions are lifted and we resume visitation and movement activities in our long-term care homes and retirement communities. Further details on the breakdown of the estimated net COVID costs are included on slide 19 of this presentation and in our MDNA. Turning now to the individual business segments in slide 11, our long-term care operations in the second quarter saw revenues grow by 18.5 million or 11.6% to 178.5 million, which includes COVID funding of 17.6 million. NOI decreased by 8.3 million or 42.8% to 11.1 million and NOI margins were down to 6.2% from 12.1% as the estimated costs associated with COVID were 8.6 million in excess of our government funding. Overall, long-term care occupancy in the quarter is down to 93.5% due to the impact of COVID, primarily driven by occupancy decreases in Ontario, where occupancy-based funding is in place until the end of 2020. The timing and amount of additional COVID funding for long-term care is unknown and will create ongoing volatility in our quarterly results. We currently estimate our additional monthly cost in LTC related to COVID to be approximately 5.5 million before any recovery from additional government funding. And we anticipate that this could continue into 2021. And the timing and amount of additional government funding remains difficult to predict. In addition to the COVID funding, the Ontario government announced in the quarter a 1.5% increase to the flow through and accommodation envelopes. Turning to slide 12 in our home care division, as a result of the impact of COVID on our business volumes and higher back office operating costs, NOI from our home health care operations declined by 82% or 6.5 million to 1.5 million in Q2, and NOI margin was 1.7% compared to 8.4% in the second quarter of 2019. As the impact of COVID intensified in Q2 of 2020, volumes from the home health care operations declined by 20.7%, excluding the impact of the BC operations compared to the prior year, and declined by 17.4% from Q1 of 2020. As Michael mentioned, we have begun to see improvements in volumes in recent weeks and are targeting to complete the rollout of our new cloud-based operating system in Alberta in Q4 of this year. Our home health care subsidy, subsidiary, Paramed Inc., applied for and received in August a payment of $21 million for the initial two claim periods of March and April under the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy Program as a result of the revenue declines experienced in the home health care operations. The subsidy amount will be recorded in Q3 as a reduction in operating expenses of the home health care segment, and we anticipate Paramed applying for additional wage subsidy periods in the coming weeks. 
The original program rules are the same for May and June, and the $21 million received to date is in line with our estimated claim amount for these additional periods. The rules for the program for July onwards were amended in mid-July by the federal government, and we will be assessing for potential future additional wage subsidy under these new rules as the balance of 2020 unfolds, which will be impacted by the trajectory of Paramed's business volume recovery. Turning to re retirement living on slide 13, NOI increased in the quarter by 20.5% or 600,000 to 3.5 million. This improvement was driven by our increased occupancy in our lease-up communities, which in had included the benefit of the opening of the Berry View home in Q4 of 2019 which more than offset the negative impact of COVID on occupancy levels and operating costs. With the easing of restrictions underway, and in particular in-person tours resuming in Ontario, we have started to see some early indication of improvements in occupancy, with a 50 basis point increase in stabilized occupancy to 91.8% at the end of July. We continue to defer our expansion plans at our Empire Crossing Retirement Community in Port Hope at this time. Looking at our final business segment on slide 14, NOI from our contract services, consulting and group purchasing operations increased in the second quarter by 21.5% or 700,000 to 3.9 million due to year over year growth of over 28% in the clients served in our SGP division and lower travel and marketing expenses this quarter due to COVID limitations. Turning now to slide 15 and our financial position, we remain in a strong financial position with good financial flexibility and liquidity. At June 30th, 2020, our consolidated cash and short-term investments on hand was $122 million, with $71.9 million undrawn on our credit facilities. In the first six months of 2020, we have renewed and extended several mortgages and finalized a new CMHC mortgage on a retirement community to replace the existing construction loan. As a result of this activity, we do not have any scheduled debt maturities until Q1 of 2022. In addition, we have taken steps this quarter to accelerate the wind-up of our wholly owned captive subsidiary, which self-insured our former U.S. operations. Following the completion of the regulatory approvals necessary to deregister the captive, we will be able to release an estimated $14 million of restricted cash back to Extendicare. With that, I'll pass it back to Michael for his closing remarks. Thanks so much, David. During this challenging time, our focus remains firmly on the safety of our residents, clients, team members, and families, and providing the care and support they need. The underlying demographic fundamentals that drive increasing demand for seniors' care have not changed. In the longer term, once this pandemic has passed, we are confident that we are well positioned for sustainable growth and profitability in all our business segments. With that, we'd be happy to take any questions you may have. Operator? We will now begin the question and answer session. To join the question queue, you may press star then one on your telephone keypad. You will hear a tone acknowledging your request. If you are using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing any keys. To withdraw your question, please press star, then two. We will pause for a moment as callers join the queue. The first question comes from Lauren Kalmar with TD Securities. Please go ahead. Thanks, and good morning, everyone. Um, good morning, Lauren. Just a just a quick question on the uh, CEWS. How did, uh, maybe you can explain the, I give some color on how Extended Care was able to qualify for uh, the March and April um, subsidy. Sorry, how it did qualify, you mean? Yeah, just, just what, what yeah. Uh, how it met the criteria yeah, I mean, it, for it. Yeah, it, I mean, it, the uh, program is based on revenue tests on a year-over-year -year basis. Uh, the rules are quite complicated. Um, to, be, to, to be clear, it's our Paramed subsidiary uh, that qualified. Um, it's by it's by a legal entity basis. So that you know, with the drop we've seen uh, with our revenues in that home health care business, and with the rules of the program and design on, on the revenue tests uh, in the program, we were eligible both in uh, March and April for the subsidy. Okay, and then um, for for I guess um, May and June, any expectation of what you guys uh, may get for those two months? 
Yeah, I think as we just said in our comments that the uh, those initial two periods, March and April, were 21 million. Uh, the rules are, are remain intact for May and June from the original uh, design of the program, and we think those those two months are in line with what we saw in March and April. And uh, as you as you probably know, in July, in, later in July, the government changed the program for the balance of the year. So there's a whole different set of rules for the balance of the year. And we'll continue to monitor that um, as as the year unfolds, and, and we watch the recovery and uh, and the pace of recovery in Paramount's volumes. Okay, um, and then maybe just switching gears here a bit on the um, on the limitation of occupancy due to two per room. How many beds does that impact for uh, extended care? Uh, we have uh, that would remove 185 beds in Ontario for us and a, a little under 100 beds across the rest of the country. And then with with it going down to two per room, does that now qualify them as, as uh, preferred accommodations? Would you get uh, the preferred accommodation rate for those rooms now? No, we wouldn't. No? Okay. Um, and then any idea what the plan is, what the government's plan is, you know, beyond 2020, um, once they stop uh, funding the additional beds, or are they expecting to... Um, to allow you guys to begin reoccupying the three and four ward beds, or what's the plan there? Yeah, I, I think at this point it, uh, we don't know uh, specifically what the plan will be. Um, I think uh, too early to say. Uh, what I what I would offer is that across the province, you know, that removes over four thousand beds. So I think that well, you know, that's going to put a lot of pressure on on individual operators and individual homes. Uh, I'd say the government uh, is certainly aware of that, and uh, suspect as they as they continue to consider additional COVID funding to help us with our with our costs, uh, and as well as uh, their ongoing considerations around potential changes to the operating funding models that we know that they're working on. I think that will all get uh, sort of put in the blender together, and and uh, as they think about uh, further changes in funding, but. At this point, it's, it's uh, too early to say exactly what will happen uh, come January. Um, okay. Yeah, no, no shortage of uncertainty with all this stuff. Um, and then I guess this is another sort of uncertain topic, but uh, I, I know you're not sure about what government funding you'll receive, but any idea or guidance on, on what the net pandemic expenses will be over the balance of the year in the, uh, I guess, predominantly the LTC portfolio, but in the others as well? Yeah, I think uh, uh, hard to comment on that. To be to be honest, uh, I think what we what we I just said in my comments, you know, in our long term care division across the country, we're looking at about five and a half million right now of, of estimated monthly costs before any of the government uh, any additional government funding factored in. So um, that's you know we, we've got some sense of the cost side of the equation, but the revenue side is going to be uh, volatile here and, and a bit uneven over the coming quarters. Um, okay. Um, thank you very much for the color. I will turn it back. The next question comes from Chris Cuprio with CIBC. Please go ahead. Uh, good morning. Um, me just following up on, on Lauren's line of questioning there at the end. Um, you know, your, some of your uh, peers have also kind of reported uh, you know, high levels of, of, of um, uh, pandemic expenses uh, that they're incurring in the LTC division. Presumably, uh, you guys are not alone in, in experiencing this type of burn rate. Uh, um, is there any reason to believe that most of this would not be ultimately recovered, uh, given you know the, the profit models of, of, of different operators? Chris, yeah, I, I mean, it, it's uh, it's something that we're all experiencing across across the entire sector. Up until now, we've seen about two thirds of the costs uh, covered to date, uh, and uh, uh, you know there's 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 quite a, a, a range of ability to absorb uh, those kinds of costs uh, on a long time you know over a long term basis across the sector. So, uh, you know, the larger operators are, are you know, certainly have uh, more flexibility to, uh, uh, to uh, cover that than the smaller operators do, uh, as you can imagine. 
so uh, we don't really view this as a sustainable situation. We think that there's going to have to be a reaction to it. Uh, but as David said, um, uh, there's a number of other things going on as well. So, uh, you know, you, you'll recall that on July 30th, the Ontario Long-Term Care Staffing Study was, was released. Um, so that was the, the, you know, the report of the expert group assembled to respond to the recommendations coming out of the Galice inquiry. And, uh, you know, it calls for uh, significant increases in staffing for long-term care. Uh, and the Premier's reaction to it was that, uh, uh, you know, just, just a, a comment in one of his uh, uh, press conferences was that uh, we do need to fix staffing in long-term care. So they're certainly working on it. Uh, and, and so we may see something uh, on a permanent basis uh, as a result of those, those recommendations. So... Uh, we're really hard pressed to say what you know what kind of a number it would be and and when it would be, uh, but uh, you know we're we're waiting for that. And of course, the other thing to just keep in mind is that uh, these costs are covering things that we have to do because of the pandemic. When the pandemic subsides, uh, most of these costs will disappear. Right. Okay. Uh, understood. Um, maybe just um, moving on to uh, to Paramed. Um, with respect to um, kind of what you're what you've been seeing in the business, um, how have um, uh, you, you 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 highlight the uh, change in ADVs? Uh, so that's great. Um, how are how would you say that uh, kind of referral volumes are? Um, are you are you basically acting on as many deferrals as you can, or is there still a kind of a big gap between um, uh, referrals and what you're executing on? Like, is the bottleneck more on, on getting people back to work? And then maybe if you look at the uh, type of hours um, that, that's been increasing, is it more of the um, more specialized type of, uh, of um, hours versus more of the traditional uh, PSW? Yeah, more the the in terms of the hours that dropped off, we saw a lot more uh, of that reduction on the PSW side than the nursing side. The nursing side actually held up uh, 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 quite well through this. So it was it was uh, more the the PSW side of the business that was impacted. Um, in terms of what we're you know what we're seeing come back, we've seen the referral. The referrals pick up, uh, you know, quite briskly, uh, and uh, uh, but it takes time for those referrals uh, because, of course, a referral isn't isn't per visit. A referral is is per patient, and so a patient can require services for, you know, for a year on on an ongoing basis. So uh, referrals are the leading indicator, and volumes are the lagging indicator. So we're certainly seeing the referrals. Uh, return to uh, levels in most districts that are similar to what they were pre-pandemic. So now the volumes are tracking, you know, tracking back up, and that gives us a lot of optimism uh, that that uh, you know we will return to normal levels. Of course, the the caveat in any of those kinds of predictions is the possibility of a second wave uh, causing us to go back into uh, some kind of a lockdown. Uh, that that may indeed uh, cause the volumes to go down again. So we're not, you know, we're 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 not predicting that, uh, uh, you know, that 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 won't happen. So at at this point, it's it's, it's we're very optimistic, uh, but uh, uh, you know, there are a lot of unpredictable elements uh, to uh, take into account. Is is there anything um, that, that may have changed with respect to the um, the cost structure as a result of the pandemic that would um, you know if you return back to say 2019 uh, type of levels is is there any reason to believe that the margin couldn't return to those those types of uh, 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 those levels at a minimum? 
No, not at all. Uh, in, in fact, our contribution margins uh, have have tracked very closely with the volumes, and and uh, uh, so we don't we don't see any change in 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 that aspect of the business. Okay, and then maybe just last one on 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 home care generally. I know the um, there's been a lot of um, uh, of talk about changes potentially occurring in in long term care. Is there any is there anything in 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 the home care side that uh, we should be aware of? Well, <clears throat> the one thing, Chris, to to, uh, to 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 watch for is that if there's a major expansion in staffing in long term care or a significant change in uh, uh, in in pay rates in long term care, uh, we could see resulting staffing shortages in home care. Uh, so the two uh, the two sectors operate uh, right next to each other. So if, if there are changes in one that aren't echoed in the other, uh, then uh, uh, you know then we could see some challenges uh, uh, that, that that result on the labor front. That said, uh, you know that report that I I mentioned uh, earlier um, that reported on July 30th. Uh, they they took pains to point that out and and you know uh, made the recommendation that anything that happens in long term care should be echoed in home care. Uh, but we'll see how that plays out. Thanks very much. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris. The next question comes from Cal Woolley with National Bank Financial. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning, everybody. Hi, Cal. Hi, Tom. Um, just a couple uh, financial questions off the top. So I just uh, want to make sure I understand how this wage subsidy uh, will work. So you'll be booking like a $21 million net cost reduction next quarter with the Wage subsidy. Yeah, the, the the accounting treatment of that subsidy uh, for us, it's, it's treated as a grant. So for in our policies and under IFRS, that gets netted against our operating expenses of the paramed segment in Q3. And then, uh, for whatever you apply for within Q3, that would theoretically then come with come in Q4. That's sort of the way to think about it. No, it, it, the additional amounts we talked about those extra two periods, uh, May and June, that's likely to be in our Q3 as well. Okay. All and right. then that, and then, and then, sorry, go ahead. ahead. No, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. <laughs> no, uh, sorry, um, I was, I was going to say that it's the, it's in our operating, maybe, I don't know if your next question will be this, but it is in our operating and therefore it will be in our AFFO. So just to, similar to the, how the COVID expenses impacted our AFFO this quarter, that will that will uh, be included in our AFFO uh, in Q3. Okay. Um, and then, do you have any? Just because the number your numbers are going to be, you know, shifting a lot over uh, the next little while, um, depending on how these reimbursements go. Do you have any like covenant? Uh, uh, concerns or challenges that you need to think about with your lenders, like just as we go, sort of go through this cycle? No, uh, we're at Q2, we're on side with everything. I mean, the, all of our covenants are tied to specific mortgages and sort of more traditional debt service coverage uh, tests and things like that on the on the uh, long-term care side uh, and retirement side. But at this point, we have no... Um, no concerns right now on the outlook on anything, and in our, there are no covenants in our bonds. Okay. Um, and then just uh, for SGP, um, any concerns about the health of the customer base that you've got right now? Um, are you, you know you feel comfortable that that group of customers is going to uh, continue to continue to operate through this period? I can't imagine a scenario where. Uh, long-term care homes uh, that are uh, currently in operation would yeah. somehow go out of business and 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 then 
the, the, the residents have nowhere to go. So I, you know, I, I, we don't really have that concern. I think the retirement side of, of, of the sector, uh, uh, is, is, is clearly starting a recovery at this point. So we, you know, we don't, we don't anticipate a problem there. So in fact, what, what, what we are seeing is that as, uh, the sector has been under some financial challenges and of course has experienced uh, procurement challenges, particularly with things like PPE, that we're seeing really significant interest in, in our offerings. So as a result, we're continuing to see growth in that segment, despite the fact that our sales team can't travel. Uh, they've moved everything to online, but it doesn't seem to have interrupted their uh, their ability to 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 bring new uh, customers to the business. Okay, and then I, this is sort of a technical question, just in terms of like how operations are specified between the government and the operators for the lunch or care segment. But the extra costs that you incurred, like this quarter, are these a result of choice risk management choices that the operators are making? Or are these public health directives coming, uh, you know, coming from the municipalities or in fact are coming from, you know, the provinces themselves, like to manage the risk in the homes? Well, I'd say it's a, it's a combination. Uh, uh, first of all, there's a very, very collaborative engagement going on between government and, and the operators in the sector. There's also a very collaborative uh, activity going on between the operators as we all, you know, uh, share best practices, share data, share learning uh, in terms of how best to defend uh, uh, our, our homes and communities from, from, from the virus. So uh, uh, that, that's driving all of us in a, in a similar direction. You can see our costs, you know, are similar. Uh, the government doesn't direct us to hire certain individuals. Uh, they are certainly uh, helping us with, with uh, uh, revisions to policies and procedures that <clears throat> we know work. And I think you're seeing that across the whole sector as we get, uh, you know, those worst outbreaks that occurred very early in the pandemic uh, are now thankfully behind us. So, uh, so, so it's not it's not prescriptive in terms of what we need to spend, but uh, certainly in terms of the policies and procedures that that uh, we're required to follow, uh, that has uh, both product and staff costs uh, associated with it. Okay, thanks for. Oh, sorry, just one other question. Um, are you know as you sort of work through the darkest part of uh, this? crisis, um, you know, is there anything that sort of stuck out to you in the way this system works? Uh, I'm sorry, about the lunch and care system that, you know, like, you're just like, geez, this really needs to change. Like, because, like, this isn't, you know, like, we sort of run, in, run into some challenges, you know, in a regular kind of year that, you know, because they're not so significant, you know, you can kind of work through them, but this was such an extreme thing. Um, but, you know, just in terms of the way the funding mechanisms all work and, you know, the, the ability to deliver good care, like, do you, do you, like, as one of the largest operators, have recommendations for, like, hey, these are some things we should really be changing in the system? Well, I, I think there's two things that, that have been true for a long time, uh, for over a decade, that the Ontario Long-Term Care Association has uh, uh, pointed out um, many times in, in its advocacy. One is that the older homes need to be replaced, uh, and we've had applications into the government, uh, into various governments for replacing our older homes for a long time. Of course, we've talked about them on these analyst calls, uh, you know, long before the pandemic, and, uh, and, and that clearly, uh, uh, has, you know, proven to be a vulnerability for the whole sector through, you know, through, through the pandemic. So, uh, 
so that that probably be at the top of my list. And then I think the second thing is that that uh, that the way that the uh, homes were funded for uh, for delivering care was such that uh, if there was any significant challenge, we just didn't have the resiliency in the sector to be able to respond uh, the way the way we would like to. And uh, uh, the uh, uh, Ontario uh, uh, College of Nurses has uh, uh, published a, a, a summary of all of the long-term care reports uh, that have been generated over the last 20 years in Ontario, um, and there were there were 35 of them. Uh, all of them were similar recommendations about the kinds of staffing levels. And this staffing expert panel that reported on on July 30th repeated a lot of those a lot of those recommendations. So I think there's a you know there's a need to recognize that uh, over time, very slowly, the acuity and the needs of the residents in long-term care have been increasing, and the staff complement hasn't been increasing in tandem with it. I think that there's a recognition that that's the case, and that. Uh, you know, we're very, very hopeful that we'll make strides in that in that direction uh, to be able to add the staff, uh, you know, to our to our teams in the homes. So those are the two things that I I point to. There's probably you know some more minor points, but 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 those are the big ones. Okay. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Thanks, Cal. Once again, if you have a question, please press star, then one. Our next question comes from Yash Sankpal with Laurentian Bank. Please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon. Hi, Yash. Uh, I think you mentioned that you have submitted an application for 4,000 beds, so that essentially covers all your properties. Um, are you not worried that if all of those applications were approved, you would be um, faced with like a lot of uh, redevelopment projects, or do you think they will be approved on a tiered basis? Yeah, yeah, I think I think you're the latter. Um, so we have uh, those 4,200 beds of applications in. I think that you know, realistically. Um, the, the, uh, those projects will get built over a period of time. Uh, I think in this, uh, with the new program just announced, uh, you know, the government's targeting 12,000, um, so 20,000 beds in total. Uh, and, you know, if you think of that relative to the 32,000 seabeds that are in the province today, uh, it's clear that not all of those existing seabed projects across the province are, are going to be covered by, by this initial uh, phase of the government's new program. So I think there is going to be a cadence to, to how these uh, get approved and, 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 uh, and how we think about things as they unfold over the, over the next, say, five years, which is the initial target phase for this first wave. Got it. So, okay. Um, so the, the wage subsidy that you are getting for your uh, home care business, what percentage of wage would that cover? Like roughly, I'm trying to understand uh, how much is the government compensating for? Well, the design of the program, uh, you ask is to, 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 to reimburse employers that meet the, uh, the tests of the program for up to 75%. Of, um, of a, a weekly wage maximum of $847. So it's a very complicated calculation. You literally are doing the calculation employee by employee and looking at the wages paid over these discrete four-week periods. So um, it, it, the target is, is, is to pay a, a you know, maximum 75% uh, uh, of up to $847 a week per person. The reason I ask is you have uh, some part-time employees, like uh, a mix. So uh, how did the government address that, like based on how much they were earning before? Or yes, it's, ba it's based on what we've actually paid during certain periods of time. It's not based on a on a, a you know, implied or imputed 
amount we would have paid, it actually looks at what we did pay in the specific period and give us back, gives us back a portion of those wages to help. Okay. Uh, moving to the retirement home uh, division, where is, uh, would you be able to say where your occupancy is at this point? Yeah, I think as, as, as I think Mike or I alluded to in the script, we have our as that occupancy at the end of June was 91.3%, and we had seen a slight uptick in July uh, in our stabilized occupancy to 91.8. To, to so we've seen about a 50 basis point uptick uh, in, the, in the month of July. Okay. And lastly, on your uh, HGP division, how is the pipeline looking at this point? Like, I'm trying to understand how much this business can grow uh, by, say, year end. Uh, yeah, it's a couple of things. First of all, uh, uh, <laughs> given the year that we've had so far, uh, our, our, uh, uh, we're extremely reticent to predict how many sales we might close in the next six months. Um, but that said, uh, uh, there, there's still quite a lot of room to grow. Uh, you know, we're, we're expanding our sites to uh, eastern Canada and Quebec where we haven't uh, traditionally done very much business. Uh, and we're also uh, looking at expanding the offerings. Uh, so uh, there's other products and services that we currently don't offer through the partnership that, that we think we can add. So. Uh, so in terms of, of additional clients and, and additional revenue from existing clients, uh, we think there's a lot of, lot of opportunity there to, uh, to, to continue to grow. And of course, uh, as uh, the uh, new beds get built, uh, we're going to see uh, growth in, in that business organically as as our different clients uh, grow their, their, their population of beds as well. Right. And recently you expanded into Western Canada. Um, so are you happy with how that expansion is um, growing? Yeah, we're, we're, we're delighted with it, actually. I mean, I think the magic of that business is that... Uh, you know, our, our, our role is to uh, give our, our partners access to uh, very favorable contract terms. But when it comes to the logistics of delivery and, and ordering and that sort of thing, it's the, it's the partners of the business, the suppliers, who take care of that. So uh, we don't have the, the challenge of having to uh, expand operations into other geographies. That's something that that our clients, uh, pardon me, our partners uh, provide to our clients. But you need uh, boots on the ground at least uh, for coordination purposes, right? Correct. So certainly, from from a sales and a customer service perspective, we have that. We have people uh, covering the the geography. <laughs> Of course, we've had to reinvent the way we do that, uh, given that, that nobody's traveling at the moment. Uh, so we're, we're learning a lot about how to, how to provide that customer service virtually, which I think will have uh, ongoing implications, positive implications for our business after, after the pandemic recedes. Like we're seeing a you know, significant, significant uh, reduction in our in our customer service costs uh, through through the pandemic. Okay, that's good. Thank you. That's all for me. Thank you. This concludes the question and answer session. I would like to turn the conference back over to Jillian Fountain for any closing remarks. Thank you. That concludes our call for today. This presentation is available on our website, as are the call-in numbers for an archived recording. Please don't hesitate to give us a call if you have any further questions. 
thank you again, everyone, for joining us, and have a good weekend. Goodbye. This concludes today's conference call. You may disconnect your lines. Thank you for participating, and have a pleasant day.